Last time, we found our first biters in the base after the wall was breached and some future foreshadowing seems to indicate it won't be the final time we'll have to deal with that. So let's get on with it. After the breach scared the stonks out of me, I repair the entire wall again. Well, as entire as it gets, because even before I'm all the way around, at least 4 attacks have damaged the just repaired wall again. Anyway, let's keep doing research towards blue signs. We must get to bots before I'm locked into spending all my time fixing up the wall. And with big biters not too far away, that moment probably is not too far into the future. We take a whole bunch of walls because... Yeah, the biters have already breached both walls again. Fortunately, this time they died from still being on fire. So, we are going to add a third wall to the base, in the hopes that it will give us a better response time to any breaches. Spoiler alert, it didn't. The attacks from the south are surprisingly strong, given how few biter nests seem to be down there. Anyway, that third wall gives me a nice, but entirely misplaced sense of security. So naturally, we go ahead with our car and solar panel plan and leave the base behind. So, what is the plan, man? Well, first of all I want to get a clue of what is going on in the world. Check how many expansions have popped up and where. For example, this nice expansion here nicely blocks access to the lakeside coal patch down on the peninsula. Despite being unlabeled, I kinda set my eyes on that one, but oh well, I think we lost that one now. So let's get on with the real plan. We are going to do the failed raider exploration plan from the early game, but this time we'll do it right. With solar powered radars, the radars won't need coal to operate, there won't be any pollution to annoy the nearby biters, and the radar will eventually scan out to its very limit. Not only will this truly generate extra terrain for the biters to expand into, the radars will also give us some vision on biter expansions either directly or by slowly rescanning nearby chunks after they reach their scan range limit. Even though radars are military structures, they won't just trigger biter attacks by themselves, so as long as biters don't accidentally wander within range, for instance as a traveling expansion party passing by, they should leave our radars alone. So we go around and around, placing radars all around the map.
as we approach our base from the north side through the unsettled corridor. Hey! And our biter expansion is settling the corridor as we speak, and already two worms have spawned. We quickly take out the remainder of the expansion party, but the damage is done. Two indestructible worms right in our passageway. Well, at least they didn't settle any biter nests. But then, disaster strikes. Yet again, the biters have breached the wall, and the small biter is in my base. The small biter is not the problem. But the gaping hole in my wall opening the door for the next giant attack is... I am very far away from my base, and in my panic to get back... I almost drive straight into this uncharted biter expansion. This terrain is already pretty hard to drive through, and it becomes even harder when there's more unexpected and uncharted biter expansions suddenly popping up out of nowhere. Finally we enter a clearing, where we can make some haste. But I just seem to bump into every piece of water and every rock out there. We still gotta make it past the new medium worms in the corridor, and into my base between all the attacking biters. We seem to be just in time, and... Oh no! A huge attack is about to flow into my base, and there's nothing I can do to stop them. I put all my trust in my walls and flamethrowers, and I have been slacking off severely into organizing any backup defenses. I haven't made a single red ammo, I haven't even researched ammo damage upgrade too, which means my yellow ammo does barely anything against the plentiful medium biters. Once they destroy the turrets, they switch to a new target and mass. And that new target is me. And I die. Oh man, the biters continue on their part of destruction, while I realize my respawn point is right here under the spaceship, in the middle of the attack. Fortunately, the busy biters don't like switching target mid-attack, which gives me ample time to scavenge my items from the lifeless body of... my clone, I guess. But oh man, am I woefully underprepared to deal with this attack. I have nothing on my hotbar, I can't find stuff in my inventory, I don't know how I did it here, but somehow I survived and took out the biters. Well, let's not ask questions about that and continue, shall we? The first thing we do is patch up that hole. Before I start to... Pistol, the last remaining medium biter in the base. Yeah, I really gotta step up my defense game. If this had happened just a little later, with big biters instead of medium biters, the game would have ended right here and now. Still, this means I fail the hardcore challenge rules which I normally abide by, but I decide to continue the playthrough anyway. Perhaps I've been slacking in the defense department too much and we won't be able to catch up anymore before we are overrun by the biters. But if we get through the next phase successfully, then the fun phase will begin, as we will have to start to expand our base without being able to clear out the biter bases. Somehow, we will have to assimilate them into our base. So, what do we do after being breached again by the biters? Well, the same thing we always do, Pinky. 
we will add yet another wall to the defense. And hope the biters don't obtain the intelligence needed to break the fourth wall. With the wall fully-ish repaired and with evolution about to break into big biter territory, I want to get our solar radar exploration done as soon as possible, before any big biters are chasing me around. And since we are passing by anyway, we quickly patch up the oil outpost wall as well. Before almost crashing full speed into an uncharted biter expansion. Wow, space is already getting quite tight. And as the evolution factor grows, the biters are making new expansions more and more frequently. We may not have a lot of time left before it becomes impossible to traverse between the biter bases and claim resources outside of the base, but we are nowhere near ready to claim anything. I mean, we cannot even leave the base alone for long enough to set up a few raiders, let alone build entire outposts. Anyway, soon we are done setting up those remote solar outposts. I've literally explored all that I can, as terrain further out is blocked by giant impassable biter bases. Now it is up to the raiders to reveal and generate the rest of our final map size. The only thing left to do outside the base is to gain better visibility on the important resources near our base. Since these raiders just need to provide local visibility and won't need to scan new terrain further out, we can suffice with just a single solar panel. And while that generates only 20% of the raiders full power demand, that single solar panel is enough to keep the area visible during the day. Of course, all of our raiders will black out during the night, but that is of little importance. And with evolution just 0.3% away from big biters now, we completed our raider adventure just in time. So, after we chase the attacking biters back to our base, it is time to make a decisive switch in priorities. We will need a higher damage output against the big biters, because if they will make it into our base, well, let's say they won't be leaving anytime soon. But we will. So we quickly set up military science and first go for some much needed damage upgrades for our flamethrowers. Before shifting focus to making a hard beeline for bots. First up is engines. Now this engine setup is as compact as it will get, with no belts around the outside and only two belts down the middle. Visually, it may hurt on the eyes, but hey, on the plus side I forgot to place lights, so half of the time you won't even see it. Anyway, through some black belt, black belt magic, additionally all four of the ingredients somehow make it through to the flamethrower assembler in the bottom. Conveniently, flamethrowers require exactly the same ingredients as engines, plus the engines themselves. 
we just gotta be sure not to overproduce them, as these turrets cost a whopping 12,000 iron per stack. Meanwhile, the enemy comes in for an attack on the left side of the lake. Or, no, I stand corrected, on the right side of the lake. A little indecisive, are we? On both sides of the lake then, I guess. Even this early in the big biter phase, they have already almost breached our quad wall in multiple places. I guess that's not surprising given the frequency of massive attacks coming in. Fortunately, the biters seem to mostly ignore the oil outpost. While you are watching the attacks, I set up the red chip and blue science assemblers. But we won't have time to set up all the oil processing stuff to actually start off blue science production. The biters are about to break through our walls again. Fortunately, by now, we managed to produce the necessary flamethrowers to finally finish our initial base defense. Ten and a half hours in the game. I really don't want to spend the time to repair a 4 layer wall all the way around my base man. I just will plug the holes with new walls and pray I can leave the repair jobs to our future bots. Of course that comes with the risk that the heavily damaged wall layers may break in surprisingly swift succession during a single assault. After finally plugging the last wall and placing the final flamethrower, we will try to fully focus on fabricating flying frames to make construction bots to maintain our walls. Hopefully we will make it in time, before the wall falls. By the way, off cam I have placed bunches of random belts a couple chunks out from our walls to further limit biter expansion preference near our base because accompanied by the big biter, also big worms are now able to spawn. And of course, the big worms are also immortal in this playthrough. If they spawn just outside of our walls, they will outrange our flamethrowers, and we would have no option but to retreat inwards, until our whole base has imploded into nothingness. It's been almost 7 hours since we set up the oil jacks and we have gathered over a million oil before we could even start to think about processing some oil. But now it is time, so we prioritize oil to the flamethrowers and with a separate pump we will supply the oil refineries, making sure the pump switches off when oil levels get low. After setting up plastics and sulfur against the back of the red chip infrastructure, we somehow spaghetti sulfur through to meet up with the engines. Plastics comes in from the bottom, completing the last ingredient for red chips. Thank you. 
and soon we are producing our first blue science packs. And not long after we are on the way to advanced oil processing, the first blue technology on the way to bots. We immediately make the switch to make the most out of our limited oil stockpile, as advanced oil processing gives us roughly twice as much bang for the buck compared to basic oil processing. Now, the beeline to bots requires 5 blue tags, but all of them are cheap, with a total cost comparable to the single tag of blue chips or low density structures. And while indeed setting up a fully automated robot frame setup is one of the harder challenges in Vanilla Factorio, it is quite easy to use some temporary hand feeding setups to acquire your first few hundred bots. Electric engines! <laughs> They are basically just normal engines with some green circuits and covered in green goo. Batteries just requires a sulfuric acid plant next to your already existing sulfur plant, and then we sprinkle in some iron and copper plates and voila, batteries. Meanwhile our earlier radar scan plan has completed its mission, and we have scanned out the full extent of the world for the foreseeable future. But also meanwhile, our outer walls start to resemble Swiss cheese again. Not good. After the bot stack beeline was completed, we stopped researching. So we could save up the red chips to make Robopods, instead of turning them all into blue science packs. We also managed to find this convenient corner to fully automate repair packs for the future Roboport network. However, we supply some extra resources in this helper chest to speed up the initial batch. And with a simple wire connection, we make sure to limit the amount of repair packs in the network. By now, the batteries and electric engines are done, so we add it all together in these bot frame assemblers, together with some of our stockpiled steel and green chips. And that's the hard part done. It takes a while to assemble the robot frames, but in the meantime we can lay out the Roboport network. We start off with one in each of the four corners of our base, before connecting them up in the center. We kept the Roboports a good distance away from the wall, so the bots won't arrive on the crime scene too early, when the attack and accompanying flamethrower carnage is still ongoing. We only want them to arrive and start erasing all the evidence after the biters have... gone to a better place. A yellow storage chest area will allow us to supply the bots with selected stuff by hand, as well as give the bots allocation to bring deconstructed rocks, trees and base parts while the red passive provider chests will give the bots direct access to key base elements like walls, inserters, belts, pipes and replacement flamethrowers. Well, a beeline in Factorio is never a true beeline though. There's always issues popping up which cannot wait. I happened to spot this biter group on the map near to the copper patch I set my eyes on. That seems like yet another biter expansion party.
it is quite far away, but they are in a key location, so against the odds, we immediately jump in our car and head out to meet them, hopefully before they start spawning the new biter base. Will we be in time to stop them from forming a new biter base? Well, if it's up to this rock, we won't. Even the planet is conspiring against us, but hey, it is their planet, I guess. Anyway, this time we don't even bother to ask questions later and shoot first, a gesture with great impact on the biters. It is a little weird though that at this stage all 12 of these biters were small biters, so I check the debug to see if this is actually a current expansion group, but sure enough, the blinking circle confirms they were about to get busy. Anyway, we celebrate the fact that the base hasn't been breached during their absence by enjoying this nice bonfire with our friends. As most of the bot frames should be ready by now, I think we can safely say that we can safely say that we are safe now. Unfortunately, red chip production has been down all this time due to a small build error. Even worse, the timing of this error is just too early to blame it on the bots. Very annoying indeed. Anyway, we now have enough frames to make 250 of our flying friends. And with over 600 work projects waiting for them, it is time for the moment of Now, with just 30k iron remaining in our starter patch before we achieved automated repairs of our defense, the time has come to tread beyond our cocoon of safety and venture out to try and claim new resources among the expanding biter madness. How we are going to achieve that, I have no idea. I guess we both will find out next time.